I'm just interested in um, the representativeness of um, in certain groups, which um, have been seen as the uh, major stakeholder when it comes to negotiation process with the state, with the central government. Um, you mentioned about um, the way in which the insurgent groups um, address the issue of autonomy on behalf of the people, right? Um, so I'm just wondering um, when the conflict um, became protracted to the point where not only the government, um, you know, launched repressive measures against the people, the minority group, but um, the insurgent groups as well, um, they also, you know, started to kill their own people, um, you know, be traitors, traitors, so on and so forth. Um, so in this kind of situation, um, I'm just curious whether they are still seen as a legitimate negotiator by their own people. And if they are, um, what are the grounds, what are the legitimate grounds they, do they claim? It's a, it's a very interesting point you've raised. Uh, I'll try to answer this question by giving you an example. An example is from the Sri Lankan uh, case. <coughs> In the middle to late 70s, when the insurgency, Tamil insurgency really started in Sri Lanka, there were at least six major groups that were formed. And one of them was the LTTE, or the Tamil Tigers. Now, from the very beginning, and this was into the 80s now I'm talking about, LTTE made it very clear that it considered only itself as the legitimate you know, representative of the Tamil people. And anybody who disagreed got a bullet in the head. So fellow Tamils, you know, civilians who did not like the LTT became a target. Other fronts, you know, leaders belonging to other fronts, if they stood up and said, we want to talk to the government and you guys want to fight, so we don't like that, you know, we should seriously negotiate with the government, they got a bullet in the head. If the government showed any intention of starting a dialogue with, let's say, some more moderate people, then they became a target of the LTT. It reached the point when you know, fratricidal war took place within the Tamil insurgents, and the LTT emerged as victorious. They basically sidelined everybody. They threatened the Tamil people that if the people don't obey the diktats of the LTT, then the LTT will come after them. And one of the key dictates was that every Tamil family must contribute to the war effort, economically, and also by giving a son or a daughter to go and fight you know, in terms of recruitment. So all of this happened. Now, why was the LTT able to do this? Partly because LTT was very resourceful. It raised a lot of money. And there are accounts of various dodgy operations of the LTT, but also partly because I think the Indian government at that time, in the early 80s, had some bones to grind with Sri Lanka, and they wanted to use the LTT, not because they loved the LTT or believed in its ideology, simply that they were watching the LTT massacring everybody else and saying, if I have to back a horse to win the race, who will I back? So, you know, these guys are most powerful, let's back them. So, Indian support also you know, came in handy for the LTT. Now, to some extent, I would say that when the autonomy discussions were taking place with the LTT much later in the early 2000s between the Vikramasinghe government and the LTT, and Prabhakaran, the leader of the LTT, had come out of the forest. You know, he was in hiding in the jungles. Uh, Bala Singham, who I quoted, you know, he was the chief negotiator. He was the ideologue for the LTT. These guys came out and. They were, they were talking to the government. One important question emerged, and this question has reference to what you just said. People said, why are you only negotiating with the LTTE? Because they are the hardline you know, group. What kind of fate are you going to give to the Tamil people? Because 
you know, so far they have been repressed by Sri Lankan soldiers, Sinhalese government, and now when you give autonomy to the to the Tamil areas. This autonomy will only be exercised by the LTT. LTT will not allow anybody else. You know, this is not a democratic organization. Any other Tamil political party that stands up and says, I want to challenge the LTT, LTT's claim to be the sole representative of the Tamil people, you're finished. You're, you're, you'll be killed. So by giving or at least talking about autonomy, what you are basically doing is encouraging the creation of an LTT dictatorship which will condemn the Tamil people to an even horrible fate, you know, compared to what they got under Sri Lanka. And part of the reason why the LTT became expendable, you know, and I, and I say this with all seriousness because the Indian government, I'm sure, signaled to the Sri Lankan government that if you finish the LTT, we'll be not standing in your way, you know. Nothing was said diplomatically, nothing was said publicly, but I'm sure Sri Lanka would not have dared to do what it did had they not had prior approval from India. And, you know, not one tear was shed when the LTT was killed. If you look at the complaints by international human rights groups or by the US government or Indian government, was that you finish the LTT, now really deal with the Tamil problem. And deal with the problem in a humane fashion, in a just fashion. This was what was being told to the Sri Lankan government. And people were really uneasy that in killing the LTT that they had to kill so many other people. Uh, it was the cost of the war in some senses. I, I may sound insensitive, but how do you fight an, an insurgency that is intermingled with the local population without having massive collateral damage? So the answer to your question is, with these sort of groups, you know, groups like the LTT, or I can give you the example of Chechnya. Uh, you know, the, Chech the Chechen groups, there was, there was uh, some concern in Western academia, Western media, that if the West were to back the Chechens, you know, in effect, we are basically backing the creation of a gangster republic, you know, some sort of gangster autonomous region. Uh, same would have happened with the LTT, and nobody wanted that. So. It's a, it's a problem that, you know, if, if there are factions who are fighting each other within that same community and they are killing their own people because they want the total allegiance of the people and they do it by threat, you can't talk to such people and you should not talk to such people. And insurg insurgent groups should not underestimate the lesson of the Sri Lankan case, that the LTT did not go anywhere eventually because they lost almost entire international community who all saw LTT for what it was, you know, a brutal, ruthless, authoritarian organization. I, you, you didn't, you didn't uh, uh, talk more detail in the Tamil Hillam because of uh, Sri Lanka government decided with China in those days and then that's why Indians supporting. After the, the killing of the Rajiv by suicide bomber by Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. that India is shaking. And then when the Rajiv party is come to take over the countries, so they're not supporting the Tamil Hillam. Sec secondly, is the mistaken. I met them, the, these people in international forum, and they confessed the our mistake is killing Muslim in the, our area. Even this Muslim is the Tamil itself. They are the, the same race, but they are different religion, but they're killing Muslim and become the disaster and the camp and refugee in, in, in their land. So they, they lost about uh, some kind of ally. And then uh, they finish. And before they finish, you, you have to remember they had this, the incident that when they bombed the, when they bombed the airport with the Amirate airport, who just take over the Sri Lankan airport on bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And that Emirate one Arab country is the source of the mediators for negotiations. So we cannot refuse the third party, whether they are Western or non-Western, mm -hmm. because this situation is supply the peace process. Secondly, on the, yeah. on the Mindanao, I agree with you that MLF failure because of uh, their corrupt 
or 1998, I went with a peace convoy from uh, Mindanao to Manila. Ma Manila to Mindanao, and I discussed personally with them, with the Kasti Wen and the rest of the leadership of the uh, Muslim world. We encouraged them to get together with the ASEAN because they're going to have the next uh, two, two years with ASEAN will go together. In those days, he just mentioned to us that the group of MRF, who is the led by, in those days, the leader is the Salamat Hashim who now he passed away in the Indonesia. He declared a struggle with the Mindanao government. I said, it's, we said it's totally wrong. It's because ASEAN is going to be one. That you have to do like this, nobody is supporting. And then he declared a war and they lost. And because of the loss, so by the supporting military of the Malaysia, so they come back at the table for discussion forget about the MIMF because they, they also fail. So the, the, the new procedure that one of um, uh, my friend is the dealing with, they try to keep more autonomies. Because of this, Agino is more, more, uh, more flexible than the others. So they, they will allow more than who Muslim existence to implement the Sharia, Islamic law in the, that is the main goal that they allow them for exercise economically, Islamically, and on the only finance and the less, on the foreign affair, on the military, is belonging to the central state. So we have to observe this because the first uh, Tivoli signed by the, uh, during the Marcos time to have the peace in, the, in, in Mindanao is only for the business purpose of Filipinos government. But, this time, it really clearly they want to achieve the goal. Secondly, uh, thirdly, I, I see the southern of Thailand, I just back from Hajai yesterday, and they just shooting one of the men in Songha. The same party, same group, same supporter, but the country of interest, they killing. Not upper north of Songha. Not further down in the deep south, people, my friend also campaigned about the autonomous. Okay. When we talk about autonomous in Thai people, they're thinking they're independent, that they have mentality injection by the uh, security. That If you talk about autonomous, it means that you are one to separate the countries. This is totally wrong. And then, then I just sent my friend yesterday to the IJ to, to see the autonomous region in the IJ. And when I back, what happened after election of the recently with the uh, provincial government? They spend 150 million baht to get the post. So I don't know the future. Thank you. Yes, there was a definite role of China uh, in the destruction of the LTT. India's position changed after 1991 when Rajiv was killed, for sure. But I think even before that, the Indian government, if you look at the uh, Indo-Sri Lankan Accord of 1987. Basically, the accord was a diplomatic victory on the part of India against certain things that it wanted from Sri Lanka. Uh, Prabhakaran was forced to initially accept the accord. And there's a story of Prabhakaran being uh, kept under lock and key in a five-star hotel in India. And there was pressure put on him saying, you've got to accept this. We're going to announce this. So he, he was in India, so he was out of his territory. So he said, OK, I accept. But then he went back to Sri Lanka. And in the very first meeting he had major speech to his people, he rejected the accord. He said, this is nothing about Tamil thing. We are not surrendering weapons. And then the Indian peacekeeping force that went in, it went in with 8,000 soldiers. When it left two years later, it was over 100,000 soldiers. And this is the darkest chapter in India's military history. Uh, a lot of people, Indian scholars, call this the India's Vietnam. Uh, so Rajiv's killing was the last straw. But the LTT became unpopular with India. And India realized probably much later that uh, it looked like you backed the right horse. But the right horse was also the wrong horse. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, I take that point that, you know, 
that that LTT. But but it comes back to my you know my 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 idea that when and I think she raised this question, uh, vital question, and uh, I have thought about this as well that uh, no arrangement for autonomy should be entertained seriously if the end result of that autonomy would be a non-democratic outcome, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, if you had an autonomous solution in Sri Lanka, and if the northern province and the eastern province had been amalgamated as the LTT wanted, and if you had accepted LTT rule in Sri Lanka, this would have been a very non-democratic outcome, because the LTT would not allow any democratic healthy discussion, it would not allow any other opinion or platform to be created. As you mentioned, you know, LTT deliberately targeted Sri Lankan Muslim community in the eastern province, and the eastern province has always been a problematic province because there are Muslims there, and Sri Lankan government over the last 50 years have settled Sinhalese people, Buddhist people there. So the LTT's claim that the eastern province is part of its Tamil homeland is a contestable claim. Northern province, yes, mostly Tamil, but eastern province is a mixed area. So part of the violence was tactical, that you know, if we can attack the th Muslims, force them to leave. It's a, it's, a, it's a form of policy of ethnic cleansing, if you, if you know what I mean. You know, terrorizing people to leave the area, go out, so that we can claim this area as ours. And you saw the same in former Yugoslavia, I'm sure, Bosnia and Serbia and so on. Um, I, my, my personal opinion is that you know, if the outcome on the basis of autonomy is a non-democratic outcome, uh, it's, it's difficult to support it, which is why an autonomous solution for Chechnya was problematic because of the way the Chechens fought. But then if you turn the argument around and if you say, look, a small minority group fighting the might of a nation state what the odds are so against the group and it's so heavily in favor of the state that these groups have to resort to all kinds of activities in order to you know balance the scale uh, it's a difficult it's a difficult argument to accept because i think a lot of people would say that even though the fight is a very odd fight you know in terms of power because the group has limited resources, the state is all powerful, you still got to stay within the rules of the game. If you break the rules, and I think the world now is coming to a point when groups that you know, assassinate people at random, shoot their own people, uh, put their own people at harm's, harm's way, or like the Taliban believes in an ideology that would be so against everything that the world has fought to achieve, take the people back to the you know medieval times almost uh, these are you know groups not worth defending internationally uh, and i think a lot of people will agree that the tigers lost because eventually at the very end they had no friends anywhere everybody saw what they were and said if you finish if you're finished that's better you know finish it people were uneasy about the way it happened that you know so many civilians died and the, the politics in Sri Lanka after that, you know, I think that's the bigger danger, that politics in Sri Lanka now is very draconian, very authoritarian. You criticize the government, you get a bullet in the head. Uh, and the government is now sending thugs, basically, after people who they consider to be critics of the government. So you can't say anything about the government. If you're a, a newspaper editor and you write an editorial criticizing government policy, you know, thugs will come into your office, break your office, beat you up, or the government will send police and arrest you and put you in jail on some, you know, trumped up charges. And, and that's what Sri Lanka has now come down to. And that is a danger sign. On the question of Mindanao, I, I accept your point. Uh, my own skepticism is that this deal with MILF, uh, it must be, you know, full of sweeteners that will help the leaders of MILF to, you know, to, to benefit from it, uh, personally uh, and as a group. But in Philippines, I think the real danger is the spoiler danger. 
because there are extremist groups out there who may spoil this thing and which may lead to further further problems and i'm not so sure whether the government of philippines uh, has some sort of a national consensus behind it saying that let's solve the mindanao problem by giving them autonomy allow them sharia law and so on and so forth i'm not so sure you know i'm not an expert on philippines politics there are other people here who might know it better my sense is that there is no national consensus on this question of autonomy this is something that the government has done it could become a political issue for the government later on and you know opposition groups may create trouble for the government on this uh and on the question of southern thailand there are people here who know it much better than i do uh if there are now problems within you know the southern thailand minority community if there is killing now happening because of various reasons you know that's a, that's a danger sign uh but i think the bigger question of course in thailand is if i understand it correctly and i i know sri lanka better because i followed it for a long time and i think there's a parallel with sri lanka is this notion of the state belonging to one community you know in sri lanka the whole concept of federalism and was alien to them and in a sense was a problematic concept because by definition it's a uninational country sri lanka same, thailand, same, same same in thailand yeah, so if you if you exactly so if you say that this is you know this is sacred land entire land is sacred for buddhists and therefore only one nation in thailand and sri lanka would say the same thing only one nation in sri lanka you are automatically denying any territorial rights to the minorities now in sri lanka's case there are serious religious works which are out there which try to justify what at best is a mythical account of the founding of sri lanka and if you read the mahabharata you know it says that prince vijaya came to sri lanka with a band of followers because he was ordained directly by lord buddha lord buddha came into his dream he said go to sri lanka establish my religion there and therefore that is the fundamental fact cannot be changed and any tamil invasion that happened happened much later these were invaders they came from the north probably there was a land bridge between southern india and sri lanka at one time you know if you go back to ramayana you know this talked about filling this land bridge there must have been pockets there where there was a sea was coming in so they you know put more rocks and stuff build the bridge back and rama's forces then invaded northern sri lanka who was the king ravan who was ravan he was a tamilian you know worshipper of lord shiva so he was a hindu he was not a buddhist aryan Ar- aryan so this this whole concept that the tamils came as invaders from the north silanis kingdom was already there could not defend against the tamil invasion so they got pushed south tamils therefore established themselves in the north so if you say this is all a result of illegal invasion then where is the question of territorial rights here you guys have no territorial rights so the whole notion of tamil homeland sri lankan government would say does not exist and i'm sure thai government would probably say the same thing chai one that there is no notion of a territorial homeland yeah, here we have some good thing british angel เนาะอยากใครอยากมีคอมเมนต์หรือคำถามสุดท้ายไหมคะโรฮิงเกียอินเมียนมาร์ a form of ethnic cleansing I'm sure uh, they want to get rid of uh, minority Muslim people they think rightfully they should be in Bangladesh uh, but the Bangladesh people uh, basically there is a division between the plains and the hills in bangladesh uh, the majority lives in the plains of the you know the gangetic uh, river the gang the ganges which is called podda in bangladesh uh, and you know the the distributary of brahmaputra which is the meghna so if you look at the plains population in bangladesh which is bengalis who are in power they are also muslims and if you compare that with the hills people who are mostly tribal uh, of origin then there's a ongoing conflict between the tribals and the plains bengalis now the rohingyas are more resembling of the tribal people even though they are muslim and you could say look you know 
Bangladesh as a Muslim country should look after Muslims. But I think religion is not here an issue. The he issue here is more their culture and your you know ethnicity, you know the, the sort of ethnic composition. And the Plains Bengalis in Bangladesh look no different compared to me, you know, who's a Bengali from India, the Eastern uh, West Bengal in India. Uh, so I think Bangladesh is hesitant to take on Rohingyas. Uh, so it's a, it's a problem. It's a problem. And I think in Myanmar, uh, there is a series of ethnic problems that needs to be resolved uh, eventually. Uh, Conceptually, I think uh, Myanmar has to move towards a loosely centralized state, you know, or a decentralized state, giving the regions, you know, the Shans and the Kachins and so on, uh, greater rights to run things in their own region. But having said that, I think the bone of contention, I mean, from experience in autonomous arrangements in India and so on, from what I have studied, the bone of contention is often resources. You know, the power of taxation. How much money am I going to get from the center? And how will that money be spent? And the accountability factor. You know, if you give autonomy to a particular group or a particular region, then if they turn around and say, well, it is our autonomous right not to give you any accounts of how this money was spent, where this money ended up, you know, did it end up in our pockets or did we spend it wisely on, on the people, then you have a problem. So I think the minorities also have to realize that it is not a, you know, it is not a race, you know, like a horse race that you bet the right, bet on the right horse and the horse wins and you go to the counter and you collect your money and you go home. That if you're asking for autonomy, then it comes with a lot of responsibility. And the real issue here is good governance, I think. And I, and I think we don't stress that enough in, in this kind of discussion. And as I said to you, you know, for me personally, it doesn't matter who's doing the governing, whether the center is doing the governing or the governing is done at the state level or at the provincial level. You still want good outcomes. You still want good practices, good policies. You still want people to feel that the government is on the side of the people, that you're giving people a fair chance. You know, people have a sense of uh, fairness, justice, that government is transparent how you are spending money, people can go and scrutinize public accounts. You know, if you open the government accounts to public scrutiny, corruption is going to come down like this. Uh, and, and, and this is what I think ultimately what we have to talk about. You know, when we talk about autonomy arrangements, I mean, autonomy arrangements are really governance arrangements. And you have got to create good governance structures, good governance policies, and so on. But I'm wondering if you have any reflections on uh, governance arrangements that are something less than autonomy, because I think this is probably what people who are uh, suggesting uh, governance changes in southern Thailand as a solution are, are after, because autonomy is a very dangerous word. Uh, so, so something less than autonomy, but also something that's sort of unilateral, not necessarily the result of uh, negotiations with an armed group, but something that the government does of its own initiative as a way to solve the problem? I think you raise a very interesting question. And uh, perhaps I can try to address this or answer this by giving you a concrete example. Uh, I have followed the problems in Indian Kashmir for a long time. Uh, if you go back and start looking at the reasons why the insurgency started in late 1980s, then you know the most important conclusion is that the Indian central government interfered very unfairly in the political process and the political institutions that were already there at the state level in Kashmir. And the reason they interfered is simply this, that the, that the political party that ran the central government at that time, it wanted to improve its political prospects in the state level. So therefore, it wanted to manipulate elections and so on. It had an outcome in mind, and it was working towards that outcome. In the process, completely destroying a democratic setup. And people saw through that. And they didn't like it. They thought that um, 
the government was taking away their democratic right to choose their own government, mm. which I think is a very fair, you know, uh, aspiration on the part of the people. And when the Indian government continued down that track, it ended up creating the insurgency. So uh, Indian government later on tried to say, look, you know, the insurgency happened because Pakistan sponsored it and so on and so forth. I mean, they all lie. Uh, it didn't happen that way. You know, it, because you interfered in an unfair way at the state level, you know, you've got this outcome, blowback effect of that. Now, after this long period of insurgency, what the Indian government has realized is talk of autonomy, who to talk to, what it will, you know, incorporate. I mean, all these questions are difficult questions. And the politics is going to be very vicious of this. So what we should do is we should have two tracks side by side. On the one hand, anybody wants to talk autonomy, what it should entail, what sort of powers should be given by the center to the province, and so on and so forth. We'll continue on this track. We won't put any time limits. We won't put any set objectives, but we'll discuss. There's an open discussion going on with anybody who wants to talk. So if there are insurgent groups who, you know, five years back were fighting the forces, now realizes that the fighting is going nowhere, wants to come and, you know, into that process, happy to talk to you and it's an open offer and they created a set of interlocutors in Kashmir who went and basically talked to everybody and said join the process and no you know no commitments no set objectives but it's a discussion process so they did that but on the other hand sort of a parallel track which they have been working on since 1996 which is now beginning to yield result which is to try and hold absolutely free and fair elections in a, in a state or in a province which is insurgency infected. 1996, voter turnout was very low. So you could say that whatever government came to power at the state level was not really a representative government, fair point. But since then, the state elections that we have had, voter turnout kept increasing even though hardcore insurgent groups kept threatening the people that if you participate in elections then we are going to target you we are going to come after you but people still was brave enough to go and say no you know we, we are not going to give in to your threats we think the process now is beginning to look fair state is not intervening in this and the indian national government said look whatever comes out of this process, you know, whoever comes into power through a democratic process, we are happy to engage with that government and we'll help that government. And that over the last 15, 20 years has restored a lot of trust. So if you go to Kashmir today, the separatists are actually a minority. They are sidelined. And the younger generation who is now of voting age, they have come up, they are saying, okay, Democracy is great. We can choose our own government. That's not the problem anymore. The problem is you must kickstart the economy of an insurgency infested state. You must descale the military presence. You must you know, take away the Armed Forces Special Powers Act so that the soldiers cannot go and arbitrarily enter somebody's house or arrest people and put them in lockup or torture them or whatever it is they're doing. You can't do that and you scale down the military operations. You know, we don't want to see sandbags in the streets of Srinagar. Uh, if I'm a young Kashmiri, I'm walking down the street, I don't want a soldier to come in front of me and say, stop, I'm going to search you, you know, just because of the way I look or the way I walk. We don't want that. So we want those things to go away. Political process is now back to normalcy. You know, we are having periodic elections. We are throwing up our own governments. If there are platforms that don't want to join the process, they are realizing fast that they are losing out. That it's better to join the process and fight it through the elections. But the real question, of course, is employment, industrialization, and so on and so forth. So recently, the government sent you know, a prominent leader to, to Kashmir Valley with a cream of India's industrial talent. And uh, they held meetings. They wanted to know from the people what kind of investments they want you know, what sort of areas investment will happen and so on and so forth. So I think what the government has realized is, you know, we'll talk autonomy on one track and powers and functions and new institutions or what might work, what may not work as a process. But on the other hand, let's do everything in our power to create good governance in, in the state. Let's try and rebuild the faith of the state 
in the fairness of India's democratic principles, you know, in the fairness of India's constitution and the, and the, and the political rights that come with it. I think substantially also it has helped that since the 1990s, India has now moved as a country into an era of coalition politics. That there is no one dominant party which controls power at the central level. And in some senses you might say this has led to coalition governments which means more gridlock and less efficiency of policy because you know the main parties will have to carry coalition partners with them. And one of the biggest, I think, obstacles of coalition politics has been on India's economic reforms. You know, business is basically saying the reforms are not far reaching enough or not fast enough. We need more of these reforms. And the government is saying, yes, I agree, but you have to realize I have got five parties to take along with me, and I often cannot do what I really want to do because of the you know exigencies of coalition politics. But in a in a positive way, I think this has restricted the misuse of central power in India's provinces. And in that sense, as a political scientist, I would say what India is moving towards is an era of a more mature federal polity. That people are beginning to see that federalism is really now working in India. That different provinces are throwing up their own regional political parties or platforms these parties are governing not only the province, but oftentimes, you know, they end up with 10 M members of parliament or 20 members of parliament in the national parliament after a national election. And because now the governments are coalition, oftentimes, you know, if you're a small regional party and you have 25 MPs with you, you're the kingmaker in that government. So these parties are beginning to flex their muscle even at the national level. So it's a, you know, simultaneous development. On the one hand, this era of coalition politics leading to a greater sense of federalism. On the other hand, the government now has realized that we should not be interfering in provincial matters. Let democracy function. Let people elect government that are truly accountable to the people. If they are not functioning or if they are not performing, then the people have a right to throw them away. And, and once people realize that this right is a serious right, I've got five years, I've given these guys five years, they haven't done anything, out you go, somebody else comes in, and this is a process which is fair, nobody will interfere. I think it begins to build confidence in, in institutions of better governance. In India, at least, the governance is now beginning to open up in, 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 the, in the sense of people's scrutiny of government. You know, you have the Right to Information Act, for example, which is a, an absolutely historic uh, piece of legislation. Anybody can ask to see any accounts, you know, government salaries, you know, how contracts were obtained. You know, this sort of information is now out there, and you can, as a citizen of India, you are entitled to know these things. India's civil society has grown. You know, the, the NGOs, local NGOs, who deal with corruption issues, is now such a massive thing uh, that governments are now scared. I mean, politicians are scared that if you have skeleton in your cupboard, it will come out. And if it comes out, you're going to pay a political price for that. Political parties, the moment there is some expose of some leader, you know, some corruption, immediately distance themselves from that leader, no matter how high that leader is, and say, you know, oh, he's being expelled or she's being expelled, you know, we have nothing to do with it. So all of these things separate from that autonomy discussion is happening. And I think over time, if you give it time and if you give it you know, a very patient handling, it will lead to better governance of not only the center, but also the provinces. In that sense, it will empower people. And my personal view is often the problems that lead to conflict can be solved if the intention is good, if, if scrutiny is good, uh, if people have a say in the choice of the you know of their leaders who are going to solve these problems uh, so therefore i don't often see it purely in ethnic terms saying oh this is an ethnic group they want to exercise their right of self determination and therefore we have conflict oftentimes that has nothing to do with the conflict the conflict is about i mean i you know i go to darjeeling for example i give you that that, that example it's about not having drinking water why because the drinking pipelines that was built by the british 
are the same pipelines which are still offering drinking water to the people and most of the time they are so full of leaks that water pressure is you know hardly there in Darjeeling uh, and people are saying I don't care who, who runs the administration whether it is run from Calcutta or from Delhi or in Darjeeling itself I want my water problem to be solved and if you don't solve it I'm going to come out in the streets and I'm going to demonstrate so just by giving Darjeeling autonomy they realize it didn't solve the problem because the guys who had power they didn't fix the water problem, they didn't fix the roads, they didn't fix the schools, they took the money, center pumped in huge amount of money. You can't blame the center for not giving money, they gave money, the money went into the pockets of the politicians. And uh, you know, the, the people in Darjeeling today are saying, what, what good did it do? You know, we had this agitation, all was great, they created the Hill Council, our leaders became you know, the decision makers, they had money in their hands and look how they govern. So I think you've got to convince people that you know it's, it's really about governance, you know, how, how you govern. In Sri Lanka's case, again, or, and I'm sure there's parallel probably with Thailand, you know, you have a unitary state, you deny people rights. I mean, one of the reasons why the insurgents in Sri Lanka started, many people don't know this, government enacted three pieces of legislation which basically said, if you're a Tamil in Sri Lanka, you won't get admitted to university. If you're a Tamil, you won't get a job. And if you're a Tamil, you better learn Sinhalese. Because if you speak Tamil or speak English, you're going nowhere. Now, you tell me whether that is an example of great governance? No. So, eventually it was a governance problem, which then the Tamils said, oh, we are being discriminated because we are Tamils, yes. But we are discriminated because of bad policies. And how do you fix that bad policy? You know, you've got to have some sort of enlightened leadership. I mean, I often give the example of Nelson Mandela to my students, you know, when I teach these sort of things. And I say, look, you know, leaders can make a difference. I mean, Mandela, when he became the first black president of South Africa, he single-handedly probably stopped a civil war in South Africa because of his belief that mistakes of the past cannot be solved by making more mistakes. So he was very Gandhian in that sense. You know, his argument was, eye for an eye is going to make everybody blind. So that's not a solution. So we should not seek retribution against the whites for what happened during the apartheid era. There was a section within the ANC that was itching for blood, believe you me. Uh, and Mandela did not allow that to happen. There was a big article in The Economist about a couple of months back on South Africa saying, once Mandela was gone, what South Africa has become is unbelievable. You know, succession of poor leaders. Mbeki, Jacob Zuma, and where are they taking this country? So it's about leadership, it's about governance, it's about good policies. At the end, I think it's about treating people with fairness and respect. But it's not one-sided. You know, if you say, look, the majority has this responsibility, I think minority also has the responsibility to say, look, you know, we are not going to indulge in anti-national activity. I mean, if you are point came up very prominently in a discussion in, in Britain uh, recently. British government saying, look, you know, we can't have British Muslims basically saying, I'm going to indulge in anti-state activity. I will stay here, I will take all the benefits of being in Britain, but then I will go train in Afghanistan or Pakistan and come back and bomb Whitehall or, you know, create trouble for, for the British government. Then the question is, something has gone wrong. You know, these people have begun to sense or feel convinced that the state has not treated them well or treated them fairly and so on and so forth. He opened a Pandora's box in, in, in Britain saying, why have they formed this, this kind of a mentality and how do we fix it? So the discussion of autonomy really, I think, I think Chaiwath would be a better person to say on this, is really a question of you know, good governance and, and treating people with respect, you know, the rule of law and so on and so forth. But something that everybody sees and ac accepts as being fair to them and offers them a sense of justice and treats them with dignity and with some sort of respect. And all countries have that, that, that issue. You know, in India, if you look at relation between Hindus and Muslims, same thing. I mean, you probably may not may know that you know when Indira Gandhi was assassinated in 84 members of her party instigated a riot against Sikhs in India because two of her bodyguards who were Sikhs shot her dead 
So two guys who happen to be Sikhs shot her dead for her policies, you know, of invading Sikhs' holiest shrine, the Golden Temple. And what happened after that? You know, a pogrom of violence against the Sikhs. India conveniently forgot, or, or the people running the government conveniently forgot the massive sacrifices that Sikhs have done for India, and went after Sikhs. I mean, I remember there were you know Sikh students in my school who overnight shaved their beard and cut off their hair because if you go out on the street looking like a Sikh, you know chances are you're going to be publicly lynched. Uh, and I think it's a national shame, you know, that India, the government allowed that to happen, and people who did that should be you know, should be, should be prosecuted, should be punished for what they allowed, uh, you know, to take place. Sri Lanka, same thing. You know, I mean, the Rajapaksa government now is sending out basically political thugs against anybody who opens their mouth against the government. So, you know, you either live in fear or you, you leave Sri Lanka, go out, that's okay with the government. But then, is it good governance? That's the question.